In this series of lectures, we will discuss the cellular and physiological response to injury. Specifically, we will be focusing on the roles of the immune system. Please study these terms so that we will all be on the same page for when we discuss these topics. There is more than one mechanism through which cellular injury can occur. One is physical. The second is a deficiency of a necessary substance. For example, a nutrient deficiency could lead to a lot of damage to different cells. Interruption of normal processes can also lead to cellular injury. Cells respond to in injury in many ways, but the overall theme is that these cells will begin to make molecules that either they do not make under normal conditions or that they do not make as much of under normal conditions. These newly synthesized molecules in response to cell injury accumulate within and between the cells. One way that cells react to stimuli or injury is that they increase their size. Resistance training to build up muscle mass is a great example of this. We know from muscle that we must use it or lose it. So if we're doing resistance training, the muscle or muscle groups we focus on will become bigger. This is because in this situation, the muscles are undergoing a process called hypertrophy, or an increase in size. On the other hand, if someone could not use a muscle group for an expended, extended period of time, such as if they've broken a limb and it's been in a cast and they haven't really been able to utilize those muscles, then the muscle mass in that area will decrease. And this is a process called atrophy, meaning a decrease in cell size. In addition to change in cell size, we can also see alterations in cell numbers, the types of cells, or how they grow. The previous slide with atrophy and hypertrophy refers to the size of the cells but we could also have an increased number of cells. For example, in this figure of prostate hyperplasia, which means the increase in the number of cells, this will make the prostate tissue much bigger and it may impede the normal flow of urine and create some very uncomfortable symptoms. Also, if we have repeat damage and repair to certain tissues over time, we will see a change of cell type. And this we'll notice in this picture here of what we call Barrett's esophagus in this endoscopy. We see a section here that is a deeper red than the other part of the esophagus. And this is damage due to repeat damage and repair, damage and repair, damage and repair, and so on. So eventually the cells and the area uh, get replaced so they're no longer the original top of uh, esophageal cells, which makes this darker red color that almost looks like a burn here. This could lead to carcinogenesis or the development of cancer. This process can occur in all types of tissues. So here we see um, cervix tissue, and this is tissue that we might collect from a pap smear. And here we have from the normal development to mild dysplasia to the development of moderate dysplasia. And it is because the changes in size, number, type, and growth of the cells that we can use this as a tool for screening and diagnosis for certain types of cancer. And we'll cover this more when we uh, go more into depth into discussing cancer. Infection can also cause cellular injury. Infection means there is an invasion of a microorganism into our body. So that term in immunology is called pathogens. 
For an infection to cause cellular injury, we have to have a pathogen present. For example, we need to be infected by a bacteria or a virus or some other microorganism. Another contributing factor is host susceptibility. If we have a very good defense system, our immune system can fend off the microorganisms and we won't develop an infection. So when people get infected, it's for some reason that their immune system could not work to fend off the pathogen. The environment also plays a role if it is conducive to the proliferation of the pathogen. For example, high humidity or high heat favor the development and proliferation and spread of certain microorganisms. Certain factors can influence host susceptibility and can affect how easily one can get an infection. Age and gender, for example, very young people such as newborns and the elderly people tend to have weaker immune systems. So it makes sense that these populations are more likely to get an infection. If we think about what we learned in getting the surf saved certificate, the same groups are at high risk for foodborne illnesses, which is a group of particular infections. There's also hormonal status and stress, which can also affect how strong the body can react and fend off the infection. Now you'll notice nutritional status and physical activity are highlighted because these are two conditions that are modifiable to a certain extent. By paying attention to our diet and achieving a good dietary balance, as well as engaging in regular physical activity, we can build a stronger immune system. On the other hand, if someone is malnourished, the person is more likely to develop not only infection, but other diseases. This is why when we talk about malnutrition, we emphasize that malnutrition is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. As far as physical activity is concerned, this is a very hot area for research and public attention. Overall, studies indicate that if someone is regularly engaging in sport and physical activity, this person's immune system is stronger. However, very intense training can actually lead to a depressed immune system for a short period of time. So if someone who's not usually very active suddenly decides to do a very intense workout episode, this could lead to a compromised immune system, although it's only temporary. The key message here is that we want to encourage people to engage in regular physical activity. There are many types of organisms that cause infection. Bacteria, viruses, fungi, and then also some uh, lesser commonly known ones. All of these are invaders into our human body. When we have an infection going on in the body, it means not only do we have these invaders that have entered, we also have them growing, proliferating, and producing toxic material such as exotoxins and endotoxins, and also certain enzymes that are destructive to human tissue, as well as spores and bacterial capsules. All of these are what the microorganisms need to do for their survival and for their life cycle, which is all done at the price of our health. Overall, there are four steps for the course of infection. Number one is incubation. This refers to the time of entry by the microorganisms into the body to the appearance of the clinical signs and symptoms. So the pathogen is already inside our system, but we are unaware or can't detect them yet. This is actually a dangerous period because the person infected likely does not know that they are infected and are probably continuing with their usual activity. And this could expose other people to the same infection. So this is why in certain situations for infectious diseases, we have different quarantine periods. Some diseases may be up to three weeks, 
others may be longer. We just want to make sure that these individuals are not in the incubation period and to be able to observe them in a controlled environment so that they do not expose other people to the same danger. The next stage is called the prodomal stage. This is where the infected individuals begin to feel or sense the first symptoms, even though these symptoms could be very vague. For example, I'm sure we can all recall a certain time when we wake up in the morning and we think we don't feel so good and we think we might be coming down with a cold. So this is an example of the prodomal stage. Before this, we had already had the period of incubation time when we were infected but didn't feel anything abnormal. Then we'll have the in acute infection and its associated signs and symptoms will fully develop and eventually we'll reach the recovery stage where the signs and symptoms improve and eventually disappear and hopefully we return to 100% normal. Infection, like other cellular injury, can lead to cellular death. In cellular death, there are two terms we need to understand. One is called necrosis, and this refers to the changes within the cell during cell death. Another term is apoptosis, which is a different type of death because it is programmed. We know that most of our normal cells have individual lifespans and when they reach the end of their life cycle or receive a certain stimuli, they will go through a certain process with different changes and eventually die. Apoptosis is also a very important research topic because it involves implications of tissue regeneration and also cancer therapy. We know that cancer cells are immortal. This is one of the reasons why it makes it so difficult to treat cancer. But if we could get the cancer cells to go into apoptosis, we could induce them to commit suicides all by themselves. Many of the current chemotherapy treatments right now use this mechanism to kill cancer cells. They reverse cancer cells from being immortal into mortal cells, like the rest of our cells with a normal life expectancy. When it is time, they will die through a controlled process. As individual human beings, we are made up of more than one cell. We are not like a bacteria or fungus. We have different types of cell tissues and organs, and they work together to put up a resistance to these microorganisms. For example, our skin and mucous membranes. When they are intact, they can serve as barriers, both physical and chemical barriers, to fend off chemical and biological attacks. Different places in our body can also create saliva, tears, and gastric juices, among other things. These are some things that are helpful in defending our system. The factors mentioned in these first two bullets are nonspecific. For example, if our skin is intact and E. coli is in trying to attack and get in, we can fend it off. And if it's a different type of bacteria or fungi or virus, we can fend that off too. So the skin is just a barrier that fends off everything, as long as it's intact. Another example would be gastric juice. We know that gastric juice is very acidic with a pH as low as two. And the extreme acidity can kill many or and the extreme acidity can kill many microorganisms, not just a few types, but it can kill many things with the acidity. So this is also nonspecific. It's not just targeting one type of pathogen. The most important part of our host defense is our immune system. This is responsible for long chain immune responses, including the inflammatory response. And this can be 
activated even when we do not have an underlying disease. What the immune system allows us to do is to target specific invaders, and we will discuss this more in detail in later lectures. So just to be clear for now, in our host, in our host resistance, there are two parts. One is the nonspecific resistance, and the other is the specific resistance that the immune system is responsible for. This figure summarizes the natural resistances in our body. For example, we already mentioned skin as just a natural physical barrier, and also our saliva, which has certain enzymes that can dissolve a lot of microorganisms, as well as the acidity in the gastric juices of our stomach. And also, even in our airway, the cough reflex is another example of non-specific immunity. For example, if a peanut found its way into our trachea, or if it was a grain of corn, or a button, it doesn't really matter. We would have a very violent cough to hopefully expel the foreign object. It doesn't matter what this object was, but it would be a trigger for our cough reflex. To prevent the transmission of infection, we have several things we can do. It would be helpful for you to review your serve safe training for this, because the things we do to prevent the spread or onset of foodborne illnesses have the same principles that apply here. For example, in addition to building a strong immune system within our body, we can also do the following. We can apply disinfectants like bleach on the surface of, say, the kitchen sink or on utensils. If it is within living tissue, we can use antiseptics like betadine and ethanol. We can use extreme high heat and chemical treatment to achieve sterilization, which would pretty much kill all of the living microorganisms. And also, as a healthcare professional, we have to know when to wear what proper personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, which you can see she's wearing over here with her mask, gown, and gloves being some of the most important uh, pieces there. This table is a good summary of personal protective equipment and the universal precautions we should take, especially when we are in a patient care setting. Please read through this table carefully. During your clinical rotation, please pay attention as you enter each room, because certain rooms will have a warning sign posted to the door um, for certain precautions that you'll need to take, usually having to wear gowns and gloves. Um, and then outside of these rooms, you will see a cart where there will be the disposable gowns, gloves, and sometimes masks. So please pay attention. Do not just enter the rooms blindly because you could be exposing yourself to certain risks. And if you don't realize that you've been exposed early enough, you can even spread the microorganism around different parts of the hospital and infect other patients and your coworkers. So there are different types of procedures for different types of precautions, so be aware of that. Um, there's different things that you have to wear, whether it's a contact, droplet, or respiratory precaution. <laughs> 